All right, just in an attempt to be consistent here, I'm gonna try to vlog. I don't know as often as I as I can, as often as I want to. So uh, just gonna talk about the day and. Hopefully you get some value out of this, whether it's educational or um, just entertainment. Either one is is cool. So yeah, today I just kind of woke up, biked for 40 minutes, mountain biked, and then just did a little bit of push-ups and pull-ups, and then I did some uh, knees over toe, slant board squats, double leg, uh, single leg slant board squats as well. More of like a back lunge on that. Then I work, went and worked at my accounting firm, Granite Mountain Accounting. Just kind of uh, did some bookkeeping, that kind of stuff. So if you ever have questions on best practices for bookkeeping or anything like that, don't hesitate to reach out. Need help setting up a chart of accounts or any other services, analyzing the financial statements. I got you for sure. Because I ain't no lame ass accountant. I actually have a personality because I was a fitness trainer for, for 10 years. And I, to be honest with you guys, cannot stand the accounting industry. It literally makes no sense what they're doing. And I don't know if you pay attention, you probably don't even give a shit, but there's a mass exodus of CPAs just leaving the industry. And, and the reason is because all the old CPAs is such an old school industry. You got all these old people five years away from retirement, demand greatly outstrips supply, so they don't really care. And all the profits just kind of level out at the top. It's not really spread out. And then the offices are just boring, no windows, no good lights, just not modern at all. And then they wonder why young people don't want to be CPAs. That's why 20% of accountants have quit their job in the last two years. There's been a 20 plus percent drop in accounting majors and it's just like, duh. But with that said, a forward looking group of young CPAs that don't think in the traditional fashion of a CPA, there's going to be great opportunity because accounting's not going anywhere. Uh, AI is not going to be able to do the upper echelon of accounting. Um, it's going to be able to complement high-level CPAs, and it's definitely going to make their work more effective and more efficient, but it's not going to replace it. All those low-level accountants, like bookkeeping, payroll, that kind of stuff, that stuff should be on the way out anyway. It's not even really a value add, it's just compliance. And the fact that these these old CPAs as well just have people that went to school for so long, gave up so much to pass such a hard exam, do such bitch work for, for little pay, it's just like, man, anyone worth their salt that's gone through that much and has worked that hard is just get on their computer and start a YouTube channel, start social media, start to cut out the middleman. The numbers just don't add up. You're charging 500 plus for a, for a tax return. You're knocking out a thousand of those. It's just like, well, where's the money going? And the 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 oh, the margin is huge. The the software for the taxes isn't very much. It's it's all labor, and so. That industry is broken, but hey, we'd be on the come up trying to trying to fix it and stuff, trying to get some modern offices with some windows, some sunlight, maybe some bean bags. Everyone be working on laptops, just having a good old time, like personality and, and all that good stuff. Now looking down on clients, man, I fucking hate the CPA industry, but I'm in it. After that, I actually um, then doing I do biblical counseling. I'm in it. I go to therapy pretty much, but it's biblically based, so rather than viewing things more through a traditional secular um, counseling or, or psychiatry lens, we do try to tie everything back through a theological lens. And it's only my second time. Last time was a was a big, big barrier for me to, to overcome, and really a couple things that, that, that went off. One, these last few years have been very tough, just mentally, spiritually, all that stuff. Just so much going on. It's it's hard to really just focus and and and, and keep the energy and keep the, the good thoughts going for sure. And then you also just you just go to experts for like everything. Right? 
sorry about that. Anyways, you go to experts for like everything. So it's like we have a, a fitness trainer for our body. We go to nutritionists or we look at blogs. We're always seeking out information. And it's like, well, why not for my mind? Which is the most important thing. It's like literally everything manifests through your stream of consciousness, through your mind. And if you don't have control over that, then maybe, and if you've been trying to get control over it, but you just are having frequent negative thoughts or you're having thoughts that you seem uncontrollable, maybe just seeking out someone whose whole life and career is dedicated to that is, is, is worth it. And so um, that, that, that thinking went on, and then really the final thing is, uh, yeah, we'll just be open and honest on this. It's like my life is good. I'm very blessed. I'm on a freaking thousand dollar vlog camera. I got a nice TV behind me. I live in a nice mountain town, Flagstaff, Arizona. Don't miss meals, hydrate. But I'm human, right? And I have I have attacks sometimes of feeling um, guilty for being blessed, uh, not feeling worthy for the blessings in my life. And then from that, come negative thoughts of lack of confidence, lack of self-esteem, questions of why does anyone want to be my friend kind of thing. Why would anyone want to be in a romantic relationship with me? So really a self-worth issue. And again, I'm not every day out here just like, oh, oh I can't do nothing. I'm still a productive member of society. I, still, I go to work. Uh, I, I bear the responsibility that I have, but I do have these random attacks, right? And and it's 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 weird because you're like conscious of it, and you and you try to equip yourself with the proper mental strength and tools to overcome it. And uh, I just realized that I have personally developed unhealthy habits to deal with that. Namely, I have numbed myself with uh, with work. I tend to distract myself with a lot of work, uh, almost like workaholism, which from the outside looking in could be like a honorable way of, of dealing with things, but it does get to an unhealthy point. I've noticed that. Um, yeah, and then other than that, just, uh, just, just dive it on in, right? And then, oh yeah, the other thing is deal with... Um, because of the confidence, because of the worth, because of the low self-esteem sometimes, really jealousy issues with, with uh, intimate partners because I've just dealt with a lot of things growing up, constantly being, uh, uh, let's see, rejected. Yeah, constantly being rejected, that's the right word. Um, but it, through a child's brain, you can't really process it. So you, so you, so you internalize that as, I'm not enough. And really, you have to reframe it as an adult that it's that it's not your fault, that something greater than you can come in and, and rewrite the narrative, rewrite the story, and reorient yourself with that. And so, you know, working out, setting goals, eating healthy, hydrating, sleeping well, making sure that you keep your room clean, make sure you keep your vehicle clean, keep your hygiene clean, and then uh, dress well feed yourself good content, all of that goes a really long way. And I, I would refer to that as like the low hanging fruit. As long as you're, as you're doing that and then you're also socializing with people, you have a good balance of, of work, but also socializing, not, not work hard, play hard, just work and then a good high quality friend group that's also motivated and driven and pushing themselves to be all they possibly could be. If you're doing all of that low hanging fruit, um, and you're still having frequent attacks, or or even if you're if you're not having frequent attacks, it doesn't hurt to try to just say, hey, me talking to someone else who's an expert in how the mind works, that is a is a benefit, and that can take you to to the next level. And I, again, I've only been in it two weeks, and both times I've come out uh, very just feeling lighter, feeling like a big weight, a big burden is off, coming with more clarity, more understanding, and that's really really what I got from um, today's session. So let me let me go ahead and take you through that. And then, yeah, I'll just decide what else I, what else I want to freaking talk about, whatever. Um, so yeah, kind of what, what I was going through today and, and what kind of got me so off guard was um, 
when these attacks happen of, of unworthiness and low self-esteem and everything, like that voice is there. And I'm conscious of it. Like I've, I've been, I'm able to take my awareness and observe it. And then I try to intercept it with these different conversations, these different tools. I'm like, hey, go away. That's not true. That's a lie. Like you can you cannot be here in the authority of, of, of Jesus, right? And um, I just wasn't winning those conversations. And I was like, man, like I don't want this to happen. And so I brought that up today and... I was like, why, why is it so hard? Like, I understand what we're trying to do, and, and I'm trying to do it, but I, I feel like it's just so hard. And um, really, it's because the, what, we, what we came to the conclusion of is a couple different points. One is, all Satan or the enemy needs to do is to get you to doubt Right? Just a little bit of doubt. It only takes a seed of doubt to kind of like amplify and, 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 and um, right? reap what you sow. So a little sow of doubt can really blow up quickly and cascade quickly. And so the, the, the bar for Satan to penetrate your, your mind just isn't very high. Right? And um, the other thing is Satan has thousands of of years of experience. And while everyone is unique with their own uh, being knit together by God in their own unique way with their own spiritual gifts in this narrative to bring the earthly kingdom to the heavenly kingdom, still we're up against a supernatural power that has thousands of years of experience trying to put doubt into your mind and trying to get you to believe the lie, trying to deceive you and that is what you're up against. And, and for me, it was calming because it's like, oh, it's like I'm not losing to some JV type athlete. Like I am losing to a trained professional killer, spiritual killer. And, and for whatever reason, that just humbled me to the point of, okay, sometimes you may not be perfect. Sometimes you may, you may lose that war in your mind. And that's okay. Just don't stop fighting it. Don't give in to it so much that you turn angry, bitter, resentful, and you go down a hole. Because while the darkness tries to overtake, you have to fight it back with light. And I guess, just again, you're not going to be 100% successful with that. But it is the effort that matters because effort given enough time always wins. And light always beats dark given enough time. The good guys always beat the bad guys, given enough time. And God will never forsake you, ever. And so, if you're going through something like that, you also have to remember that God is there. God will intervene whenever he feels that you can no longer take it to that point. But it is what you need. Every second of every day, you are building your testimony to share it with somebody else, to, to hopefully bring some light into their life. And so that's the, the next thing is you will always, always, no matter how equipped you get, have these battles because of our sinful nature, because of our flesh. And so I actually started laughing so hard. I'm gonna grab some water. Mmm. Ah, parched. Ugh. Anyways. Back to being serious, um, right? Like you're always going to be a sinner. And I was laughing so hard because he was like, hey, Lauren, God, he knows. He knows what you're going through and he loves you. And he's going to make you better, a better different sinner. And it was just like the, the delivery of it just caught me off guard because he said he's going to make you better. But then he was like, but you're always going to be just a sinner. And again, that was just um, comforting because I always, and then he said, you don't have to be perfect. And, and I've been told that multiple times, but just to be presented it in that way because of the fall, because of the sinful nature, because of the flesh. 
those thoughts will never, ever go away. So it's an ongoing spiritual warfare that we're a part of, and you will always be a sinner, but you will be a better and different type of sinner as you continue to with your uh, walk with, with Christ. And so... Yeah, that was good. And then another thing is, is why is it so hard? Because of free will. God had to make good and evil equally attractive to the sinful nature. If he didn't make good, if he didn't make good and allow evil, right? He made good, he allows evil. If he didn't allow those to be equally attractive options, then we wouldn't have free will. We would just choose the better option, right? And so it's it's really, they're equally attractive, and that's why it's so hard. So we're up against a supernatural enemy with thousands of years of experience. We also cannot escape the, the nature of our sin, and the attractive option, the evil option of sin is attractive, especially in that short-term temptation. But we know in the long term, if we expand our perspective and we get control over our perception of time and we can elaborate or extrapolate it out far enough we know that delayed gratification and fighting temptation and, and, and sacrifice over time actually leads to a greater uh, overall well-being over the greater amount of time rather than giving into temptation and the immediacy and we know that pleasure feels good but we know we're causing damage to the vessel over time and to morality um, oh, and then we just started talking about the difference between men and women. And um, he said that we're just different, right? And, and, and from biblical perspective, and th this was his own opinion, it doesn't necessarily say this, but God says that man should not be alone, so I'm going to make him a helper. And so he takes the rib of Adam, and he creates Eve. And out of all of God's creations, all of his other creations are made of dust. The woman is the only creation that was not made of dust. And it's interesting because, why is that interesting? Well, it was made of the rib of the man, and now they're complete. And so, they, and so the man is one, human, one vessel, one type, and then you have a woman who's also one type, and together the woman brings something the man doesn't have, and the man brings something that the woman doesn't have, that they can never have, right? That doesn't mean that men can't have feminine qualities, that doesn't mean that women can't have masculine qualities, but they are biologically different, and the, and the emotional state is different. The way they perceive and experience the world, the way they attack problems, the way they attack life is different. And so together, though, they complete each other, and they allow each other to, to maximize the human experience, at least speaking biblically. And so I thought that was super interesting because I've just been as I converse, as I have more conversations, what I've just noticed is, is the emotionally driven, it's this women have a harder, not all women, not 100% of the time, just in my experience, a harder time making decisions, going back on decisions, going back and forth, whereas men are straight to the point. And we talked about women are more about feeling and the journey of something, whereas men are more about the results and the destination and, and getting there effectively and efficiently, not really worried about all this other stuff. So, and again, it's not, it's not wrong, it's just different. And I think valuing the difference and, and when you're approaching a conversation, if you can humble yourself enough and, and stay calm enough to just remember that it's just a different way of, of experiencing the world and it's a different perspective and it has a lot of value to it. It is very hard to understand because it's not innate to you. So you do need to humble yourself and admit that it's worth understanding that there's value in it. And then once you get to that point, you probably still won't understand it 100%, but that's okay. I think it's, again, it's the effort and it's staying calm, it's staying respectful, it's staying patient, kind and humble and gentle which is what love is at the end of the day. And so,
yeah, then we talked about a lot of other stuff, but, uh, won't really go into it, so, whatever. Ooh. Let's see here. What else is on my mind? Eh. Don't really want to talk about any of that, either. So, I think that... I do want to read a couple little scriptures, and then we'll call this a little vlog for the day. Let's see here. What did I read to this morning that was really good? So I read my Bible every single morning. And today, what really struck out to me was uh, in Corinthians here. Let's see. Goodness gracious, I should be better at this, but I'm not. Oh, here we go. Got right to it. Look at that. God is great. Um... Yeah, let's just go 1 Corinthians 13, The Way of Love. I'll go ahead and just read that, and uh, this is what kind of resonated with me this morning, so. Let's see. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love. I am nothing. And so, yeah, right? In, in Corinthians, what you have is you have Apostle Paul talking to the, the church in Corinth, I believe. Let me go back and look at this. Yeah, so that's, that's what it is, is he is writing to the church of Corinth here. And, right, we're talking the spiritual gifts. So we have tongues, we have prophecy, being able to see the, the, the mystery and the knowledge. And if you have faith, which, right, is, is how we get grace, is how we get saved through Jesus Christ. It's not by works, it's by faith. If your faith is so strong, it removes mountains, right? So something that we would deem physically impossible. If you don't have love, then you're nothing. And so what that does for us is it creates a value hierarchy. And it's saying that you may have tongues, and that's cool. <laughs> you may have prophetic powers. You may even have strong faith. But if you don't have love at the top of your value hierarchy, then it's all for nothing. And so when you're going about orienting yourself in life and making decisions, you make a decision based off of your highest value hierarchy. That's how you go about viewing the world and orienting yourself and navigating the world. And what this is alluding to is love. Without it, you are nothing. And that makes sense because Jesus reminds us that the two greatest commandments are love God with all your strength, all your mind, and all your heart, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And that's what the cross symbol is. So it is a love of God, but it's also a love of yourself and your neighbor. Because to love your neighbor as you love yourself preconditions that you love yourself. If you don't love yourself, then you cannot love your neighbor in that manner. <sighs> Going on, if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Right, so it's saying even if I sacrifice my body which is what we're called to do, not, not in the physical, like, mutilation standpoint. I don't even know if that's the best word, but we're going with it. But from the point of I'm sacrificing who I currently am through prayer, through worship, so through conscious attention of devoting my body and my mind to Christ, my energy to Christ, my consciousness to Christ, even if I do that with full devotion, but I don't have love in my heart, then it's all for nothing. And then it goes on. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boost. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So right, going back to 
which I was saying with the difference between men and women, oftentimes when you don't understand something and you're trying to get a point across and someone doesn't understand you, you tend to lean towards impatience. And, and what this scripture is reminding us is if you can keep love in the top of your heart posture, in the top of your mind, consciousness, it's going to keep you patient. It's going to keep you kind. You're not going to be rude. You're not going to be arrogant. You're not going to insist on your own way. You're going to insist on trying to understand someone else's perspective because you humbly admit to yourself that there is holes in your perception and there is holes in your knowledge of how to approach life. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. So if someone is wrong, you don't boast at them. You don't belittle them. You you also just try to pick them up and you try to 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 bring them, elevate them with you, and you rejoice with the truth. Because it's not about being right. It's about discovering truth together through the conversations, through the experiences, right? It's not about, hey, I'm right, you're wrong. No, it's how do we together have constructive conversations so that we both can uncover what the truth is, because that's the truth is going to set you free, and the truth is going to bring a level of well-being to your life. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So right, even the greatest of suffering, love is what will allow you to persevere in those darkest moments, and um, because it provides a level of connection, I would say, right? And and there's something oddly strange about humans and, and the ability for love to make us so irrational. It makes, it started wars, right? The, the whole war of Troy was about some woman. So that must have been a, let's go. Um, anyways, let's continue on with 13 and then we'll get out of here. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall now fully, even as I have been fully shown. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three but the greatest of these is love. So what this is saying, and there is different schools of thought based on your denomination within Christianity, but some people say that the spiritual gifts ended with the resurrection of Christ because of this specific scripture right here, when the perfect comes. And so some people believe the first coming of Jesus is this, and that the spiritual gifts of prophecy and tongues, etc., etc., went away. Others believe that the perfect comes means the second coming of Jesus when the earthly kingdom is now the perfect heavenly kingdom and, and revelation happens and we're all captured in the rapture and reunited with God. So the spiritual gifts, are so there's again two thoughts, are going to stay uh, until that second coming. And for me, when I think about it, just from a rational viewpoint, not even through a theological viewpoint, if you had to believe in gifts and miracles versus not believing in gifts and miracles, we know that 20 to 30% of all pharmaceutical drugs are the placebo effect. That is the power of the belief of the mind to manifest reality, physical reality, right? Material reality. And so if I had a choice, even just knowing that, to believe in miracles and prophecy and tongues and things that could help the human condition versus not, why would I leave 20 to 30% on the table if there was utility behind that choice? And so for me, it's, it's a no-brainer. I'm going to believe that we can do this, that we have healing powers, etc., just because it makes sense. Even if it's only a 20 to 30% placebo effect, I will take that all day. I will convince myself that the healing ability of the spiritual gifts is a real thing that we are gifted from God. And so those are thoughts on that. And then let's see here.
Hmm. So I'll just go to this last part, right? Faith. What is faith, right? Faith is a suspension of the material world, right? So we tend to, in the modern day age, that is, not all of us, but, and we're, and we're coming back to it. We have faith in that which we cannot see, right? But we can feel it. And so it's like, well, what takes greater faith? To, to believe in, in matter or to believe in what matters, right? It's a, it's a faith in a feeling, in a, in a movement, in a, in a moment of awe. When I look at a painting in, in a great work of art, and, and right in art and human society, people pay hundreds of millions of dollars for it. Some of that might be a tax evasion or tax break, but some of it is also, or laundering money, that is. And then some of it is, why do we value the emotional valence of such a moving art? What is it about it? It's because it captures the human condition in such a way that we cannot express it with words and something deep that resonates with inside of us. And that alone shows that there is a suspension of faith and that we value it in the spiritual and the soul more so than always what we can see and what we can feel and what we can touch. And then also you, you have faith in everything, right? You have faith in society, you have faith in culture. I haven't met the president, yet I have faith that my safety is going to be okay because I'm in America with American values and my faith has been re reinforced over 32 years of living that when I get in my car and turn on my keys, my car is going to start. That when I go to the gas station, there's going to be gasoline. When I go to the grocery store, there's going to be food. When I go to work, I'm going to get a wage. That is all faith. That is not a guarantee. And at any time, that faith can be broken. And, and over time, if that faith is broken and broken and broken repeatedly, well, your faith in that system no longer exists. I don't know if Abraham Lincoln actually existed. The only reason I have faith in it is because the authorities of my life have told me that the whole time, that that is the narrative of the country that I reside in. And so to act on an intuition based off a value system and, and because I believe that intuition is going to lead to an outcome that is beneficial for me, that is a faith. We, we literally act on faith every second of every day based off a value system and based off the meaning that we apply to the world. And so faith, right, B believing, which also, again, Jesus says, hey, it's not works, it's faith and hope. Right? Hope in our salvation, hope in our grace, hope that our fallen nature will not lead to eternal death, but to eternal life, and love. These three, but the greatest is love. And so that's just, again, it's just interesting. If, if we could actually embody that, if we could embody love for ourselves, for creation, for others, it's like, what would that look like? It seems like a pretty good blueprint if we could actually capture our consciousness and train it in such a way to focus on a love of the scriptures that is patient and kind, that doesn't envy or boost, isn't arrogant or rude, doesn't insist on its own way. If we could actually embody that and capture it, imagine how fulfilling your life would be, the, the fruits of abundance that your life would have, and how more fruitful and abundant this world would be. So whether you believe in the, the Christian Bible or not as a worldview, there is no denying that the human condition has love tugging on its heart. And why is that? And, and why do we feel that people that turn away from love are evil? And that's a universal human condition. That morality is placed on us. And for me, when it, when it comes down to just having conversations, right? Trying to uncover truth. I believe that is the single strongest piece of evidence is the morality that is placed on our hearts. So some people believe in moral relativism, that nothing inherently is good or bad, but, but that humans are the God, are the moral givers that assign it. But if you look at human history, you don't even have to look. You can just look at present day. We can look at something and say, that's evil. 
that's not evil. We believe that is evil. We believe that is not evil. And so sooner or later, there's got to be a rule book mapped out of what is evil, what is not evil, because it is truth at the end of the day. If we are imbued with it, then there is an absolute truth. It's not a moral relativism, right? Because if it's a moral relativism, then nothing is inherently bad. Nothing is off the table, which we know is not true. And so if it's not moral relativism, it could possibly be a mix of moral absolutes and, and moral relativism, but I don't believe that makes the most sense. The most sense to me would be moral absolutism, that in a moral lens, and a moral sense, there is actual truth and there is actual lies and deceit. And I do believe that the enemy is deceit and lies, and I do believe that uh, God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit is truth, and I believe that the Bible is truth. And um, so with that said, why I'm going with that is... Uh, yeah, let's just try to focus on on love. And, 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 and if you can, it, I think it's just, that's where I was going with it. Because of moral truth, I think it's worth trying to find it. I'm not saying just read your Christian Bible, but I am saying stay open-minded. If you don't view the world quite yet through a theological lens, I think it's worth exploring if you are interested in, in such things of uncovering truth. But yeah, don't stay closed-minded. Read different philosophies, read different books, engage in different conversations. See what resonates with you when you embody it, experiment with it. Because even these books, these Bibles, we do our best. But there's been so many different translations. The original script is not is not there. And and that's a that's a conversation for a different time, but we get as close as we can. We do what's called exegesis, so we extract we study it, we apply it to our lives, we converse with other people, we see what their experiences are with it, and then we dig as deep as possible into the depth of what this text is. And as long as we're continuing to try to embody truth, I believe that good in the long run will always be evil. 